In this blog post, I want to propose a model on how you can bring the buzzword of innovation into an open source community. And I must admit, I don't actually know, of course, the answer to this question. This proposal is more of just a model based on my current reading, a lot inspired by Eric Reese's The Lean Startup, but also other conversations with friends on this. And in his book, Eric mentions that successful innovation or building a successful business around a new product or service really relies on being able to cycle through the build, measure, learn feedback loop as quickly as possible in order to test new hypotheses via experiments. I really recommend that you read that book if you can in its entirety, or there's at least a link to a summary of that in uh, the text version of this blog post. And so the question is, what type of organizational structure within an existing open source technology community will enable this type of rapid experimentation and innovation discovery. Now, of course, relying on everyone in an open source community to vote on everything is probably not the right approach to rapid hypothesis-driven experimentation. At the other extreme, having rogue autonomous teams uh, build solutions that don't integrate back well into the core, into the main code database repository of that open source project probably isn't the solution either. And so this proposal tries to balance these two tensions. And so this proposal has uh, three main parts to it. The first discusses teams, their formation, the community consultation process, and a decision-making process. The second, in an advisory group uh, and t the associated talent pools with those advisory groups and how this helps support teams. And then the third is uh, some discussion about ways which uh, new code can be merged uh, back into the core code. So let's start with team formation. The principle would be that teams can self-assemble as they see fit to solve problems and test new hypotheses. And so teams that form are fully autonomous in their team members, community consultation process, and decision-making process. And this is to enable maximal flexibility for innovation and to ensure they aren't bogged down by any top-heavy top bureaucracy or any complex organizational structures. And so because of this, that means that teams can fully determine the makeup of their collaborators. Now, of course, in the spirit of open source development, it makes sense that a team has representation and members from different community contributors, but this is really up to the team to decide. And so some teams may complete a project entirely from uh, members only from within one organization, whereas other teams may wait for multiple organizations to join uh, before they start on their project. Now, also teams can determine the membership size and the skill set required. It's <clears throat> recommended that teams are probably cross-functional meaning that they can move an idea from hypothesis to development to testing without having to rely on other teams. And so probably small, meaning probably up to a max of 8 to 12 persons per team, cross-functional teams, seems to be what's used in agile workflows today. And there certainly may be cases where a particular project requires several cross-functional teams. These might be uh, sub-teams of the larger team, but the takeaway is that it's encouraged that teams contain the skill set needed to test the hypothesis fully. The previous methods of building siloed functional teams, such as having a technical team, a design team, a user testing team, doesn't seem to be the preferred method of development at this time. Siloed teams require more complex handoffs between groups. The results in reduced efficiency, slower process times, <coughs> and less individual ownership of the final product because it's gone through so many different handoffs along the way. Now, when we use the term project, a team may work on a single project or a team may work on several multiple projects. There also may be a setting where a single project involves several sub-teams, but the way to think about a project is more of a short-lived iteration of the work that a team undertakes. So perhaps the project is a single MVP or a single feature or a single experiment, but the team may bring uh, also particular uh, special members to join the team just for a particular project. But 
the general concept is that the team is probably a longer term group of individuals that more regularly collaborate and the project might be more of a specific instance of that collaboration. How does the community consultation process work? Well, given the above principles, it makes sense that the team can determine its community consultation process. When should the team seek feedback on their ideas before development? Well, it's up to the team to decide. Now, some teams may prefer to remain outside of the community for a period of time in order to rapidly develop or seek a very novel approach to something, whereas other teams may prefer to collaborate on every detail at every step of the way with the community. Now, in many circumstances, it's highly recommended that teams provide a transparent process for all community members to contribute to the discussions occurring within the team. A team isn't obligated to slow down their development for the widespread co community consultation, but it's encouraged that at least a method they choose for project development is transparent so that those members in the community who are interested to contribute their opinions have a mechanism to do so. When the, best when the best path forward is unclear for the team's voting members, this might be a good trigger, a good opportunity for that team to extend further community consultation and expert consultation. But as we'll see in the next section, the final voting rights on what the team's decision is on how to go forward still remains up to the actual team, even if they pursued a much more broad method of community consultation. And so the hope, of course, with community consultation is that what the team ends up producing will have a much higher chance of success in getting merged back into the core code base because that final project had more input from more of the community members and therefore will have a broader appeal. We go down to the topic of the decision-making process within that team. Now, teams can determine their decision-making process. So who will have voting rights within the team? Well, it's up to the team to decide. Some groups may concentrate all voting power within a single individual. Other teams may only make decisions based on full consultation with the open source community. Uh, these are kind of two opposite extremes of a process, but they may work um, depending on what the use cases are. And so if the objective, though, of a team is to, let's say, rapidly prototype and hypothesize uh, rapidly test several hypotheses to, you know, through that build, measure, learn feedback loop, probably you want a decision-making process that involves um, not too many people or also would slow down the process. And so using Nassim Taleb's idea of skin in the game, perhaps it's members who are actively contributing to a team or organizations which are actively contributing resources to that team and that project that have uh, voting rights on how they, they execute their team's operations. But again, this is uh, something that each team can organically decide along the way. The next uh, section is on advisory groups. Now, over time, expert advisory groups should be available to help support teams in their development process. These advisory groups are built around different domains of knowledge and functional work. For instance, you might have a design advisory group, you might, there may be a technical advisory group, a security advisory group. For an electronic medical record, you may want a group uh, with which are uh, fire experts, which is an interoperability standard, or you may want another group which are terminology and concept uh, dictionary advisory group. The, the simple idea is that an advisory groups are com comprised of members from both within the open source community as well as external experts from outside the community who want to participate. And this group, the exact formation I think is still a bit unclear, probably a, light, a process of uh, invitations for people to join it or people self-identifying and self-enrolling would work at the start. And perhaps it's easiest if the open source community just appoints a single go-to person for each um, functional advisory group needed to, to chair that functional group, but their, their hope is that this expert group will be able to provide high-level advice to these autonomous teams. As, now, of course, teams may choose to follow or to not follow the advice which they're given by the advisory group, but at least it's available. And the hope would be that by seeking advice, uh, that the solution that a team arrives at will have a higher chance of success and be more likely to work. 
And this would in turn then increase the chance that that team's work will actually end up getting merged to the community's core code database. Now, members of the expert advisory group may become hands-on for a particular team or for a particular project. But I think the default expectation would be to not expect expert advisory group members to provide hands-on support to teams. Their role is much more uh, providing an expert opinion rather than hands-on work. I think there's an exciting opportunity within an expert advisory group for them to form their own community of best practice. This might be a great place for people who um, come from different organizations to be able to share their experience and to learn from each other within the same uh, functional domain that they're working. Now attached with the concept of an expert advisory group is something called a talent pool. Now the talent pool is comprised of community members uh, perhaps they're volunteer members within the community, or perhaps they're paid members through uh, organizations which are part of the open source community. But the, those in the talent pool are the, the individuals who are actually able to make significant contributions to projects. So when building a cross-functional uh, team, you may need different members to work within that team to get the job done. Now, some team members for this work may already be predetermined because of the collaborating teams, and at other times, a team which is forming may need additional expertise to join. And so that forming team might uh, seek out help from the advisory group to see if there's anyone in their talent pool who might be able to join their cross-functional team and work on a project. And so members of this talent pool may be junior members uh, who are seeking a hands-on project experience, as well as you know the concurrent mentorship that they can get from the advisory group. Or the talent pool members may actually be experts in themselves who have capacity through their own project funding or time to do, put more prolonged work in on teams and projects. When talent pool members engage in projects, as I mentioned, they're going to be joining the actual cross-functional team on that project. And unlike advisory group members who are really providing more just opinions, the talent pool members are actually getting the job done and engaging, as I said, much more closely. I don't know if I'm a huge fan of the term talent pool. If you have an alternative uh, name which might be more appropriate, I'd love to hear. Now we get to the issue of merging with core. And so a team is formed. They've uh, figured out how they're going to consult uh, with the community. They're going to figure out um, how they're going to uh, seek advice from uh, experts. They've assembled a cross-functional team. They've built something. They've uh, measured its success and they've learned from this experience and kind of iterated on an idea, and they feel that they have something uh, worthwhile to share with the broader community and to reintegrate, hopefully, back into the open source community's core code database. What happens now? Well, the process of being able to innovate within an open source community and the process of being able to reintegrate the best of these projects into the code database, I think it's important to realize are two separate things. And the tasks are separate because we want the development process to really emphasize autonomy among teams. Teams, as we've said, can set their own rules and play by their own rules. But when a team is working on something that they're pursuing, it doesn't mean that their work is actually going to de facto reintegrate into the code database. What's probably needed is a small group of senior technical leaders, perhaps with long-standing history within the open source project, who may be the right group to decide uh, what is eligible to be remerged into the core code database. And perhaps this group uh, may provide advice on how something should be improved pr before it's reintegrated. Perhaps this group will seek uh, greater input from the community if there is something which is more controversial about its inclusion in the core database. But I think it would be reasonable that that uh, individual group can decide of senior technical leaders, you know, how they operate, um, how they make decisions, uh, when they need to seek wider community feedback, and what they end up merging to core. 
But the hope with this development process, which we've outlined, is that autonomous teams have the freedom and flexibility to work on new ideas, to talk with the community, to talk to expert advisory groups, and to build MVPs that gather real-world metrics about their ideas. And so that ultimately, when you get to the process of reintegration back into core, it should be successful because this can be a much more data-driven uh, and straightforward decision. Well, uh, these are my current thoughts at this time on this issue. I hope that it would enable, you know, kind of true innovation within the structure of a larger open source community. Um, and part of the reason that this might be exciting is because, you know, use uh, Paul's phrase, uh, beyond it, that this might help us move from uh, single-threaded decision-making to multi-threaded decision-making. And so there are different ways which an organization can move from single-threaded decision-making to multi-threaded decision-making. And I wonder if some of the ideas discussed in this post may enable that. Of course, if you're interested in providing feedback on this, the whole blog post is available in a Google document form linked through from the original text here. And so you can inline comment right on that Google document.